Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis. This is our first segment in a series of conversations with a wide variety of entrepreneurs and leaders that are helping to change our world. Today's conversation is with Tal Corette, the president of Silverstein Properties. For those who don't know, Silverstein Properties owns and operates 40 million square feet of real estate, the most notable property of which is the World Trade Center. While the focus of these conversations is on innovation, today's chat is a little unique. It has an additional color. Frankly, it's a fair bit heavier and more emotional, as Tall's family purchased the World Trade Center just six weeks before 9-11. Members of their team died on that day, and they have very nobly dedicated their lives to rebuilding the property, even when it would have been more profitable to sell. Tall shares with us how his wife and father-in-law cheated death by not being in the Twin Towers on the day of the attacks. He gives us a view into his journey from relative poverty to great wealth, and he talks about how to maintain emotional stability through success. I hope you enjoy the conversation. This episode is brought to you by ReShield. ReShield is part of the FounderShield family of insurance brokerage companies. It's a tech-enabled insurance brokerage focused on real estate. If you're interested in learning more, visit reshield.co. Tall, great to have you on. Thank you for coming. Uh, why don't we start at the top? Will you tell us a little bit about Silverstein Properties? Thank you, Mark. Um, Silverstein Properties is uh, a real estate company um, that is uh, focusing on, obviously, everything that you can imagine real estate is, but uh, we also focus a lot about technology. We are known mostly for our large projects, even though we do much more, we are known for the World Trade Center that we acquired it was actually on my birthday in uh, 2001, six weeks, July 24th, six wow. weeks prior to, uh, to 9-11, uh, thinking that everything is great and we know what to do with the buildings and how to improve and fill them even with more tenants and better tenants and, and take the buildings to the next level. Uh, and then 9-11 uh, showed up and surprised all of us and shocked us as a family and as a company. Um, I feel very uh, fortunate that my family members uh, are with us. My wife that morning uh, was trying to take a car to the office. And uh, this was back then when my father-in-law said, you should try the train, you should try different ways to come to the office. Um, well, how about trying a driver? You can work from the car while uh, you get there. My wife didn't love the idea, but said, I'll try it. And wow. um, at the time, we lived in Scarsdale um, with our two daughters then. Uh, later, we had our son. But uh, in Scarsdale, the commute, you can imagine, you have to get to the train station, get on the train, come to Grand Central. And after we acquired the buildings, the Twin Towers, we moved our offices down to the World Trade Center, to the 88th floor on the North Tower. And my wife waited for the driver, and he could not find the house for over 40 minutes. He was driving in service, no cell service. If you live in Scarsdale, those who do live in Scarsdale, you probably know the cell service is terrible. Uh, they didn't have ways or any Google Maps on the phone. So he kept on driving out of area to call back and say, I couldn't find your street. It was a tiny street there in Scarsdale. Um, and my wife explained again, he got to the street next door. At the end, she said, that's not working for me. She got in the car and she drove to the office and uh, she was 20 minutes late on the West Side Highway when the first plane hit and everything then stopped. Uh, my father-in-law had another uh, lucky day where every morning he would meet with tenants at the top of the world trade at the restaurant Windows of the World. It was I used to go for drinks there when I was younger. I know, I it was a great restaurant. Uh, even uh, on Wikipedia, it says that uh, the year before, it was the most successful restaurant in the world in terms of revenue. And it was a great restaurant, great views. And every morning, Larry would put his jacket on and go to meet that, another tenant, one of the tenants in the building, to ask them, how are you doing? Is it enjoyable? What can we do better for you? With the hopes, that's his life. He always focuses on tenants to listen to them and then say, okay, let me do what you're asking me to do, to improve things, to change things. You need me to add things to the building or for your team. And that morning as he's getting dressed, my mother-in-law said to him, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm going to meet 
uh, a tenant at the building. I believe it was uh, Morgan Stanley. And she said, no, you're not. You're coming with me to the dermatologist. And he has a fair skin. Uh, and every few months he has to go to be checked and, um, and taken care with his skin conditions. Uh, and he said, no, cancel the dermatologist. He said, I'm not canceling. We canceled once, not canceling again. You're coming with me. And he did what he promised, uh, what he taught me to do many, many years ago, which he said, um, the number one rule in your life, and I was very intent listening to him, uh, is to learn the words, yes, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Saved his life. Right. Yes, dear. Canceled the meeting and went to the doctor. Uh, and the, the rest is history. Uh, we lost employees here. We lost four employees and we lost a lot of friends and tenants and people that we were very close with. And we made a decision and a commitment to rebuild the World Trade Center. Um, and we are now, when we look at, out the window and I'm sitting here looking at the buildings, um, we built the entire place uh, back. We are missing one more tower that we are working on. Um, what cost us to buy 3.2 2 billion, 3.25 is costing us over 20 billion to rebuild. And that's, that's a project we are known for. Uh, but we do a lot more. We own buildings uh, across New York and in other cities, uh, Philadelphia, LA. We built the largest Four Seasons, uh, which is in Disney, in the Disney Park. Um, we have a nice partnership with the Four Seasons where we have also in uh, downtown New York we built. And uh, we are building another one uh, internationally, another hotel and residences. Uh, and we like to do things that change communities, that impact the area, not just yet another building. That's less interesting for us. It's more, can we make a difference? Can we bring a community together and create some sort of a, an increase in place of people that would love to work, live and play and enjoy themselves and really uh, have a different way of life? Um, and we're trying to do that also internationally uh, as well as in New York. So sort of a benevolent real estate mission. That's our mission. Um, so can we rewind to the 9-11 bit? I mean, the story you just told about the near miss for your family is shocking. And the whole situation we all know for uh, millions of people was a heart-wrenching situation. Uh, we don't need to recount that here. Um, how, what happened after? What happens in the aftermath of a tragedy of owning a building like that? owning a property, the chaos of rebuilding. What, what does that look like for people on the inside? So I think we all, we, a lot of us know the story of the politics and everything else happening around the world, the geopolitical politics. But I, I don't think many can imagine what you guys were going through. Um, you have made a major investment in a property, a catastrophe happens, people's lives are lost. How do you recover? Um. You know, I'm, I'm trying to reflect and look back in time. And when you live through it, uh, it's a decision you make because we had many, many exit points that we were offered many, many times to, to get out and make a big profit. Insurance companies that did not want to pay, uh, that were battling us. We were in court with them for a long period of time, for over six years. Um, and they were saying, things behind closed doors that they would not say in public. Uh, and we, we should discuss it here, but 22 insurance companies, uh, over 100 lawyers on the other side, uh, one group of lawyers representing us um, to battle that and say, we have the right and the need for the city of New York, for the United States and for the world to rebuild the World Trade Center. And you owe us some amount of money that would be uh, needed. It's not even enough to build it, but we need that capital to build. A lot of that capital, by the way, went to the Port Authority to build underground. But it's a constant, it was a constant, it still is a battle. There are 19 government organizations we are dealing with on a weekly basis. Uh, some of them are more functioning than others, uh, but you can imagine what it is to deal with government organizations. They, they don't care about the economics. They don't understand necessarily, or at least they don't behave as if they understand uh, what it means for the lives of the people involved, because time does not impact them the same as it impacts uh, the business community. And our job was to bring it back, to create a place you want to be in. When people said, you will not see anybody coming to downtown, you 
New York. Nobody would want to be here. And we've made a decision, Larry made a big decision to say, I'm going to give the rest of my life and I'm going to rebuild this. He didn't need this. He doesn't change his lifestyle, but he decided he's not going to leave a hole in the ground. And then we went and interviewed the families and spent a lot of time with uh, a big part of the families, almost every family that was willing to talk, uh, that lost loved ones. And we actually have employees here. We said, you have a room, you have a place to work if you lost a loved one. And we have people working here till today that are in marketing department, in the development, in construction, that are working in our firm. And they lost a sibling, they lost a parent. Uh, and they said, we are going to rebuild this. We're not going to leave a hole in the ground. And we have a mission. We have a mission, we have a vision. We're going to rebuild it stronger, better, so it won't ever come down again. Now, I come from a place that uh, terrorism is not acceptable. Terrorism is supposed to put fear in you and is coming as a, a way to fight um, some progress on the other side. It's In many cases, terrorism is coming from a place that uh, someone has a different opinion and doesn't accept your opinion in life. And they decide to do something negative. We should never give up on those. Otherwise, there will be a hole in the ground out the window. Downtown New York would have been a disaster. Same with the country I came from that had terrorist attack and people say, we will never give up. So for us, it was a mission, a life mission. In that period of time, it wasn't easy. It was a pain. It was scary. It was concerning. It was, how do you communicate this with your kids that are young? My, my two daughters were then uh, 12 and nine. Um, they don't understand it. And you have to very carefully explain it. How do you explain it to kids? It's not easy. Um, and then we had to pay for a hole in the ground, run, ground rent uh, when we don't have the insurance money for a period of six years. It was about $11 million a month. Wow. With no tenants paying at that time. So we can go over that story uh, over and over and I can look at it in my mind, but I think it's our obligation. I don't think it's about uh, anything else other than doing the right thing. It's not about the money. We could have cashed out a long time ago, um, but then we would have been maybe financially doing well, but the city would not do well. The community would not do well. Downtown would not do great. Um, and I think that would have been the wrong thing to do. So this became your family's more or less life mission. This wasn't a financial decision. Not at all. It was not a financial decision. It was a life mission and it still is. And I think we are proud of where we are. We still think there is a long way to go always to increase the community, to build the, the last tower and the, to get the right tenants because the buildings are always as good as the tenants in them. Um, but I think it's shown and it's doing the right, the right thing. It's shown that resilience and grit and not giving up is, is always important. And if you do the right thing at the end of the day, you have a beautiful community that is built. The downtown is amazing now. We moved to live downtown because of it. I just, we decided to move our family here because of all of this. And a lot of New York's technology scene has moved down there because of the work you've done. And I think rightfully, something to be very proud of. And now you had mentioned a couple of times through there that you're from another country. For those who don't know, you're from Israel. Uh, wh what brought you to the States? How did you make that transition? Um, taking us back in time lane. Um, so... Going back, um, I, I wasn't born a real estate person. <laughs> As uh, you can imagine, I was born in, uh, in Israel. Can't get uh, rid of the accent. And I always saw my parents working so many hours, including weekends. And my mother was working till 8 p.m. Uh, and I made a decision very young, at a very young age that I don't want uh, my life, my kids, my family, even though I was young, to, to be with the same type of life. And I did the best I could at the time. I started working um, while I was at school at the age of 14. And um, that led to the future of my, uh, my business decisions. But I started working at 14, made my first, uh, call it real estate decision by buying an apartment at, uh, uh, across the street from my parents' home. So didn't go far, but I bought that at the age of 17. And, uh, and then went to the army, like many people do. I served for six and a half years, uh, was flying some airplanes, and um, 
became an officer over in the army. And when I came out, I uh, went to the university, decided to study as fast as I humanly could, took eight, nine classes a semester, finished it as fast as possible, and had already an idea of a startup a company I wanted to start with uh, two other friends of mine, co-founders, where we started that um, uh, that company with the idea of e-commerce at the time, it wasn't that big, 1997. Uh, and we said we we're going to build a platform for a lot of companies to run their own e-commerce uh, business. Uh, I had even the fortune of meeting one of the people who today is a legend uh, and having a nice uh, debate with them back in uh, 97, 98 uh, in Menlo Park. And uh, looking back in time, um, he, he actually knew what he was talking about. I didn't know it then. He was talking about selling books. Uh, he was brought into the meeting by John Doerr. His name is Jeff Bezos. Yep, heard of him. It's dialogue. Uh, right. And we built a platform that would help power other, other sites. We ended up uh, selling the company and started a new company in the, in the games business, in the casual games business. Now, as a CEO of the, my first company, um, I knew that the market is here. It's not in Israel, a country at the time with uh, six and a half million people. Uh, there's not enough uh, commerce and there won't be enough commerce there anytime soon. And uh, I moved to the United States and thought of where is the best place to be? Is it New York, Chicago, Atlanta? All these cities are great. Uh, I spent a month in every city, that, uh, in uh, five cities and picked New York at the end for different reasons uh, to be the hub, the center for my life at the time. And that's how it brought me here, again, as, a, as an immigrant with hopes, with uh, ideas, uh, with grand ideas. And then it started to grow uh, with the second company, which uh, became at the time the largest uh, distributor and platform and uh, service for casual games. Uh, we were powering sites like uh, MSN of Microsoft and Yahoo and uh, even uh, AOL and Electronic Arts, Pogo site. The download and purchases of games, uh, they were done through our platform. The company grew and grew. Um, we had 11 offices around the world, 750 employees. Uh, and it was, uh, I would say, both life-changing, uh, dramatic, at times very scary because you wake up in the morning and you say, what is going on here? How, how do we have this? And what's going to surprise us next? Because there were a lot of surprises showing up and dealing both with consumers and with large organizations. Uh, the internet at the time that was growing and growing. Uh, and uh, every year I would have a conversation with Larry, uh, my father-in-law who would say, you know, it's, it's nice what you're doing there. With, uh, with those type of games. Not sure I, I understand all these games, but we need you in the, in the family business. You should join the family business. And I kept on saying, but I want to build a billion dollar company. And he said, I understand. And every year he would uh, spend time with me again. And then one day he says, look, um, I'm 78. I'm, I'll be 80 soon. And I need you in the family business. So let's figure this out. And he took me in a, in a ride and showed me buildings and he said, you see this building, a billion dollars, this building, $2 billion. And right. once you see those things- There's your billion dollar company. Yeah, so he said, we need you here. Right. And I understood that uh, that message went very well in that car ride. And uh, I made that decision. I gave a year notice uh, to my board, to the investors, uh, spent time there and they, they uh, paid me well, uh, sold my share and came to the family business back then. So that's about a decade ago uh, where I joined the company and uh, didn't start as, as the president of the company, but as a senior vice president that is learning, moved from being a chairman of a company, a founder, to become a, a senior vice president because I knew I had to learn a lot and then grew through the ranks and uh, reached the, the position of being the president here. That's a rags to riches story, uh, both in your own right and then obviously the family you married into, right? That's a, it must have been challenging in a lot of respects. I think when people hear that, they're probably um, focusing on the money. And I'm sure the money was part of it for you. 
But what I also hear when I hear it is a lot of responsibility, right? Uh, the yeah. transition from get, getting a company of 750 folks with offices all over the world, that sounds like a lot of responsibility. And I think the responsibility of joining the family business probably is Herculean. How has that changed things for you? Is life more stressful running a, a giant conglomerate that you know your family depends on and a lot of other families depend on? How has it changed things? Um, I think we all grow. Uh, we all learn. And um, I'm, everybody says those things, but uh, I really feel that the team around me is, is making me so much better. Um, I thought we hired great people in my previous company, in a company called Oberon or iPlay. Uh, in the games world, in the tech world, everything was moving very fast. Um, everything was new all the time. Here, things are very methodical. Um, there is a lot of uh, complexity and a lot of complications. And if you look at the, the gravity of what we do and the companies we deal with, um, that many of them, we have uh, a lot of tenants that are substantial companies and you see it all of a sudden with smart, smart people, CEOs of these companies. Um, we have thousands of tenants, but if I'm looking at the top, uh, we have 245 of the top 1000 companies as tenants. So all of a sudden when you get it with the, with the top of these companies, or oh, my wife and I had a conversation the other day with the CEO of Moody's. I didn't dream about sitting in, in a conversation with the CEO of companies like they can downgrade a country. They actually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, or, that, right. Uh, yeah, they're sitting in this building actually underneath uh, this office right. uh, in this building or sitting with uh, companies like uh, Uber or Spotify and, and really sure. having real dialogues. Uh, it has a lot of responsibility behind it. And uh, you need to take that with the right attitude and understand what it means. And uh, you grow a lot, you mature a lot, uh, and you shouldn't get confused. I shouldn't get confused with where I am and uh, thanks to Larry, thanks to my wife, she's incredible in this, uh, in this aspect, in every other aspect. She's my, always my boss of everything. We call it the BOE because um, <laughs> she's amazing. And, and she sits behind me on, behind this wall. That's where she is. That's great. Um, so we are together all the time and we can spend time digesting and analyzing and learning. And the difficulty of running a startup is one, uh, the difficulty of running uh, and being in a business like this, a family business that is run as a startup, but on a big scale and is constantly moving and shaping and adjusting is very impressive. It's to deal with big problems on large scale. Uh, in between our projects and the development projects, we have about, depends on when, which day you'll wake up, but something that could be between 10 and 15,000 people working on the projects. Right. We have the operations in China or in different countries. That's every one of these people is a life, is a person that cares about something. Every one of our tenants is a great tenant, but is a lot of responsibility as well. So I think it's um, it's changed it changed me a lot, um, and I, I hope that for the better. Tal, I live in the startup community, right? And a lot of the people who have become big names running companies we all know, most of them didn't come from anything, or they came from normal lives and now have this tremendous responsibility. What advice do you have for people who are on their way up? And there's a moment when they get to a perch where things are different for them. Maybe it's a little bit more lonely, right? Maybe it's a little bit more complicated. What have you learned personally that you think would be good wisdom for those people? And when they kind of ascend to that level, which many people are seeking, but it's not entirely a blessing. It's not always a blessing. Um, I think the number one thing I've learned is that you must have an anchor and remain humble. We, we're all going to get to the same place at the end, unfortunately. COVID, not COVID, uh, life is finite and we'll all get to the end and then we'll wake up if, if you have the opportunity and you know it's coming and you're a week before and you ask yourself, did I do everything I wanted to do? Did I do the right thing? Did I spend time with my family? Because 
it, nobody's going to count the number of zeros you have in the bank account. It's ego only. Once you reach a certain level, it doesn't change what you eat. It doesn't change what you drive. It doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. And if you learn it fast enough, you'll have a better life. So if you have a partner in life, a spouse that is uh, someone who is your soulmate, you, you have it made. It doesn't matter what, you, what you've done financially. And if you don't, you have a terrible life moving forward. And the biggest lesson is that the investment, the number one investment that people forget is in their spouse and finding the right person. And it doesn't matter what your preferences are, but find a soulmate, someone you can share and work with and understand you because there are moments that you are alone. There are moments that someone doesn't understand, investors, partners, tenants, someone would not understand. And you have to take and make tough decisions and take the right direction and it's not going to be the, the ideal direction for everyone. You're going to have a lot of unhappy people in that process. And if you don't have someone that anchors you and says, you're fine, we're doing the right thing, or you're, you're totally wrong. Someone who can look at you in the face and say, this is really wrong. And I having, I'm having those conversations all the time. Um, I remember the times where my daughters were younger and I was wrong all the time. I woke up in the morning, I was wrong before I even had my coffee. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> With time, that improved, actually. Uh, they, said, they say that daddy became uh, wiser or they became older. Um, but if you really focus on that relationship, on the family, on your kids, on your spouse, you will have a good life and then do what's right. And again, everybody has their own right. Uh, I think the right thing is to say, if I were on the other side, Larry always tells me, if you were on the other side, what would you expect someone to do? If you were the other side of this dialogue, when we're looking at, we had many cases like this where negotiations and then we get to a certain situation and then something disrupts everything and someone else comes and wants to take the place of that tenant. We actually have the uh, example in another building. And you say, if you were in their shoes, would you feel that you were done wrong? If you do, that's not something I, we can do, period. It doesn't matter what financial implications it has. It does not matter. Uh, and I think that's a way to live because I don't want to regret one day at the end of uh, life, which will come, to regret that I did things the wrong way. Tal, you talk a lot about the strength of your core relationships. Did this social mobility you experienced in your business success um, with Oberon and all the adventures before and where you are now, did you lose relationships? Uh, are there relationships you can look back on where they just couldn't endure your transition? Friends, family? Uh, not with family. Family, I think um, the relationships are great. I, I, um, there, are, there are always regrets and I, I like to live my life with less regrets if I can. Obviously, I live in the United States, which is far from where my uh, parents are and my brother is. Um, and I'm saying my parents, I lost uh, my mother about a year ago um, and we didn't have enough time. And that was a surprise to all of us. It was not expected. So in retrospect, if I had more time and I knew in, that it's coming, I would have done things differently in terms of spending more time there, more time with her. Fine. Um, the business would have taken it fine uh, if I needed more time there. You never know when, when it's needed. You cannot go back and change time. Um, I don't think that I can pinpoint friends that I lost in the process, um, but I had less time with some friends because I moved into a high pressure. I was before in a high pressure environment that I could integrate those type of friendships easier than in, a, in an environment like this with a tremendous amount of responsibility uh, and also responsibility for family at the same time. So you have to balance it. And sometimes you don't have enough time for some close friends. So to your point, um, I don't know if there is an ideal world. I don't know. Um, but uh, I hope I'm doing the best I can, looking at everything in, uh, in the mirror and saying, what would I change at the moment other than uh, spending more time with my mother and father, um, which is it's not easy uh, at the moment. You cannot go back and change. So I'm trying to be on the phone with my father. And during COVID, I couldn't even fly to see him. To Israel with uh, quarantine and lockdown. So we hope to see him soon. Can you tell me a little bit about Silver Tech Ventures, a lighter note? 
uh, you know, you're running a real estate conglomerate. You guys run the World Trade Center. Why are you doing Silver Tech Ventures? What is it? Why does it exist? Sure. Uh, Silver Tech Ventures is a platform. Some would call it an accelerator and a fund that helps startups grow and become successful. The entire mission of the platform is to spend time with the companies. It's not a 12-week program or a 14-week program. Let's prepare you for a presentation. It's a life together. And the companies come and sit with us and spend a lot of time with us. We have a team of people who are experts in product management, raising capital, taking the company to the next stage and helping. Some entrepreneurs don't know when they need the help, but they have all the resources available for them, giving them the platform to do that. And they sit with other people from the same community, other CEOs together in the same area. They have a lot of space here that they can spend time with their team. And they constantly come and spend time with us to help them with introductions and taking them to the right places. Um, trying to reflect, it happened uh, because part of it is luck, real luck, pumping out into the right people. Um, and a big part of it is passion. And I always had the passion of uh, looking at other entrepreneurs and kind of being at awe with what they are doing and saying, this is amazing. And I, I, how can I help? How can I help to, to make it a success? Even when I had my previous companies, I always spent time with other entrepreneurs and said, what can I do? Is there anything I can do to help? And one day I bumped into a gentleman called Charlie Federman that was leaving the building while I came in, gave him a hug. I don't know why. Uh, and he accepted it was pre-COVID. We could hug people. And uh, I knew him as a, as a mentor, as a smart person in the, in the tech world who had uh, more M&As than anybody, who facilitated more M&As than anybody in the country. Uh, he ran the largest uh, investment banking firm in high tech in the 90s that did 24% uh, of all the high tech M&As and many of the IPOs. And uh, doing that, he had the end game in mind. He saw the end game. And the moment I saw him, he, he was such a sweet uh, personality and uh, he was smiling at me. And I said, um, what are you doing? And he said, I'm retiring. I said, you're retiring. He was in his 50s. I said, that makes no sense. Come, come with me. And I took him to see Larry, Larry Silverstein. And Larry asked him the same question, how old are you? And he said, you're not retiring. Tal, get him in office. He's not retiring. <laughs> That's how it started. And then we said, okay, if we want to help startups, let's do it in bigger scale. We have the capacity. And we added a few more people, uh, including Larry Wagenberg and, and guys. So that's how it started, bringing the right people in place. Uh, and it kind of tied into something I love. I love to see uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, and inspiration coming from entrepreneurs. And many of them don't succeed because they don't have the right ingredients. They have the passion, they have a good idea, but they cannot accelerate fast enough. They cannot get to the escape velocity fast enough. They cannot meet investors fast enough. They don't know which investors to meet. If you could distill it to the 10 investors they have to talk to rather than 100, and then they don't even talk to the right investors. If you could take them to the right clients. So if I can pick up the phone and call, which we did all the time, we do it, obviously in a smart, selective way to our tenants and say, hey, you should speak to this company um, because I think they are good for you. And they would listen because we... I hope they listen. If they don't listen to the landlord, I don't know who they listen to. But, but uh, make that introduction, open the door, and then they can get to the right deal and it can propel the company, then they would not get to where they are getting. And we are seeing those companies really uh, blossoming and growing. I look at it as uh, something exciting. It's making me happy every day when I can do that. So I spend time in the evenings, weekends, and whenever they call me on the so phone. This is you as a tech guy who moved into real estate and you're keeping a foot in tech. You're helping the New York ecosystem. You're helping people build companies, but you're doing this for fun, right? Let's I love it for a long You're doing this for fun. Yeah. All the money that comes from this uh, eventually will go to charity. It's not like I'm looking at how can I make more money from it. Right. I'm enjoying it. It's real fun. And it's hard to explain why is it fun, but... Think of the fun you have with your family and your kids. I look at them. I don't want to look and, and put myself in the position of a parent, but I look at them. And I will be so proud when they will succeed. Right. Will be so disappointed. And I tell it to, to a lot of these founders if they become arrogant in that process. And some of them are saying, 
they look at me like, okay, uh, there is a point there because there, many people get through that and then they, they feel, oh, it's only because of me. And they, the arrogance starts to shine out of them. And I hope it never does out of any of the entrepreneurs we help. Because if it does, then we did something wrong. We picked the wrong people. Or we didn't help them understand that the success is because of so many ingredients and people around them and the investors they picked and the market and help that they got from other people, not just them. They are, you know what company was uh, in the search space? Google. They were not the first. Which company in the space were they? What number in the space? Do you know? I don't. Okay. Google was the 18th search engine. Oh. The 18th. Oh. Not the second, not the third, not the first. The 18th. That's amazing. If you, Facebook. They were not the first. Right. But the ninth or 10th depends on what you count. So it's not about being the first. It's about getting to the right place the fastest and having the best uh, infrastructure around you, the best support system behind you. And I hope we are providing this to a lot of the companies. Again, it's not us to say it. You should ask the, the CEOs and the entrepreneurs and ask them what do they think, because I don't ever believe that you should vouch for yourself. What types of companies are a fit for SilverTech? <laughs> it's a great question. I, I would look at it as uh, from the other side, focus on the personalities of the people. So we have companies from the FinTech world, the cyber world, the prop tech world, um, and some of them are just uh, in the even life science world um, where they understand technology, but they are all heavily invested in technology uh, and, and as a platform. So most of these companies are platform companies, but there is no only one segment that we feel that we can help. Uh, it's, a lot of it has to do with the personalities of the founders. Great. Uh well, you're sitting at this interesting hybrid. You've got this tech background. You're doing silver tech ventures. You, you've got, uh, you know, you're knee deep in the real estate world. Where do those converge? What, what changes do you see coming to real estate from technology that you think are going to be noteworthy and sustainable? Um, this is a decade's worth of a question. Uh, real estate is one of the slowest uh, sectors to adapt because it's a slow moving sector and uh, it will adapt technology eventually fast forward from now if it's 10 years 20 years or 30 years there will be a lot more technology that moves and changes and shapes some of it would be disruptive some of it won't that changes the real estate space um, our vision our hope and we look at our company is how can we remain at the front end at the cutting and bleeding edge of technology and how can we help other developers feel comfortable with it? Because developers feel comfortable with what they did before. And the movement is important. The pace is important for the startup world. A startup likes to close deals, iterate, change and close deals, change the product again, iterate, sign another deal and move. In the real estate world, every deal takes a long time from beginning to end. Every project takes a long, long time. And the developers are concerned of implementing something where the project will take five years. And maybe by the time you uh, monetize it or sell it, it's 10 years. If you use the technology and the startup is not there, what do you do? How do you feel comfortable that that startup won't disappear on you three years down the road and then you have to change everything from scratch? Um, so it, there is a big difference. And that's a, a main reason that a lot of the prop tech companies did not take off yet. Even if they have a great idea, it's very hard to implement unless it's to consumer, unless it's completely outside of the real estate, but just dealing with a platform so you'll find examples like Zillow's. Let's create a, a place for people to search for value of homes. But that's not touching real estate. That's outside and it's disruptive. Uh, and we are looking for opportunities to help companies disrupt also from within, if they can. How can we bring them into the platform, into the world? Because it's totally required and necessary. Real estate needs to evolve, needs to move forward. Um, and I don't see it staying where it is forever. It has to move. It has to advance. So I'd be remiss not to ask you a question about your perspective as a landlord. There's probably a lot of founders who are going to listen to this, this conversation who want to know if there's anything they should be thinking about in negotiating leases coming out of COVID. Is there strategies or ways to think about managing real estate from the entrepreneur's perspective that you would say are some insider tips? 
and you're probably negotiating against yourself, but I'm still going to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the more, most important thing is uh, to treat the landlord as if, if you were the landlord, what would you need? What would you expect? Understand the landlord well. So many times, and I was making the same mistake when I was an entrepreneur and started, uh, let's say, the last company uh, that I started, that I said, okay, um, we just raised money. We need uh, half a floor and let's get the best deal. Where you go to the landlord, they look at you and they say, okay, how much money do you really have? How long will it so sustain you? Oh, 18 months, because that's when you, you raise money for usually about 18 months. I cannot sign with you at least for 18 months. Go and find a sublease. Enjoy. Right. Goodbye. And you keep on coming back and say, I don't want to move my company every 18 months. I think I, I know what I need. Figure out exactly what you think you need and then try and have a dialogue with the landlord where you want to really be. And if it's the right location for your team, figure out a, a dialogue that says, I know I need a space for 50 people, but it may grow to 100. So can you have some flexibility in the building or what is my flexibility in moving? Do you have space that is already built? Yes, it's not ideal. And don't ask for too many things that cost a lot of money. Because the one meeting that you ask, you think you're successful, then the landlord goes back, speaks to the team, and they say, wait, wait, we're going to invest how much? What are, what are the financials they have? What is the credit? And then it blows up again. And I've been there. I lost several deals like that, thinking I'm smart, being an entrepreneur of how I'm negotiating, not knowing what the other side feels. Mm -hmm. Go through on their end. They have responsibilities and investors. And it's not because you're, you're nice and you speak fast or you know something, you will get the deal. You really have to focus on, if you were on the other side, would you sign a deal like that? What is the wisest deals deal for everyone? And then it will work. Now, in this economy today, there is an advantage for those who are looking to get space, especially if it's already made. You can get a good deal because there is enough space on the market in, in specific cities. I don't think anybody is looking for an office in rural America, but people are looking for offices in in urban environments where some companies don't know what they're going to do, how much space they need, and it's confusing. So find someone that understands and can advise you. Um, many people are saying, wait, before that, I wanted to put people in like, a, like WeWork used to say, in 70 square feet per person. That doesn't work with six feet apart. That doesn't work when COVID will come again next year. And most employees are saying, you know, give me my six feet bubble and distance uh, so I'm not too close to people and I want to work part from home and part from the office because I want to be close to you as my founder and CEO, but I don't want to see you every day. This is now normal. Let's be on Zoom. For all of that, you really need to have knowledge, data. Uh, if you go, uh, we offer to all of our tenants this platform. We're paying for it. So it's costing us seven figures uh, for Dojo, but we can offer it to any startup uh, that is uh, working with you because I like, like them to succeed here. Uh, to analyze what are their actual needs. First, what are their needs? What's best? And then they can see even which building is the best for them, which location is giving the highest proximity for all the employees, which distance in the floor, how many people work from home, how many days, which days. It does it all for them based on the data and the analysis. We can link to that in the show notes. Do you, do you think office environments are going to return to normal after the vaccine is propagated and, you know, fast forward a couple of years or has the behavior, is there been a fundamental shift that's going to be more durable? My instinct is that there will be a shift and it's an instinct. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, my understanding is that there are certain companies that are going to come back to what they were before. We already start to see that. Uh, if it's the law firms or accounting firms or different firms that it works for them. There are certain positions that can work from home and people that after they've been at home, the habit of staying at home and it's comfortable um, and they have a comfortable enough home that their kids are not jumping all over them. For them, it's okay to work from home. When we look at that, uh, we think that there will be a change of how companies are designing themselves and working in space but I don't think that there will be everybody work from home done or everybody work from the offices before it's all going to come back tomorrow with a push of a button. It's somewhere in between. I think it's closer to uh, the environment of offices and part-time work from home. And some employees in your company will come five days a week and some will come three days a week. 
it's much more difficult from all the analysis we've seen of the data. Um, it's much more difficult to hire new employees, young people, and give them the same opportunity to connect themselves with other people when they work from home. So we have a company here sitting at Free World Trade. I won't name them, uh, but they hired 500 people in uh, the third quarter of this year, and they hired 500 people end of last year. And were, we did a comparison between the, the graphs of connectivity of the people and how many times they communicate and how successful those young hires are. And we find that there is a huge drop between today to what the 500 people before. So they didn't lose their ability to hire good people. It's just much harder to connect people uh, between departments. The inter I'm saying that's because they're remote. The communication yes, issue is, is less significant. Look, people schedule a lot more meetings. And I don't think that's, mm -hmm. but um, within the departments, people do communicate, but they, the conversations that happen between departments happens much less, mm -hmm. much more siloed. The company becomes more siloed, especially with the new hires. People from the past that had connectivity, connections in the company, and they were talking to 50 different people before, they still have those connections and they can email them. But if you're a new hire and all you see is your boss on Zoom, you're not going to reach out to other departments and say, hey, how are you? I just wanted to say hello and maybe we'll have a cup of coffee over Zoom. Right. That doesn't happen. But before you saw people going for lunch, you say, hey, uh, Jesse, do you want to go out to lunch together? Or I'm going out in the same direction. And you started to build relationships. And we are all social animals. We want to be, most of us, in touch with other people. Uh, so those type of connections, uh, this didn't materialize in the new hires. And I think people will have to focus on it. It really depends on the company, but most companies will see that as a deficit and will try and figure out what to do about it. To your question, again, I don't think it would be for many people 100% back in an office, but maybe three days a week, two days a week, pick your days according to your team and your schedule. Uh, and other days you can save on commute time and work from home. But now you, you already have that, that fabric being built. And that helps because otherwise the company will need a lot more space with the distance required. Right. So it would offer. So in theory, at some point, you know, God willing, vaccines, everything else happening. We're, we're not worried. If, at some point, maybe in the future, we're not worried about disease. True. True. Right? And I'm wondering if even in that environment, if people have a behavioral change. Tal, I wanted to thank you for being so generous with your time and candor today. Uh, I know some of these topics are pretty heartfelt and emotional, uh, and I'm grateful for you sharing with us. Thank you for thank being here. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it, and uh, hope to see you in person soon. Take care. Take care. I hope you enjoyed that conversation, and I wanted to extend a very special thank you to Tall for sharing some pretty heavy aspects of his journey. If you liked what you heard, please click below and hook us up with a five-star review or a like, and please feel free to share. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. If you're watching this and prefer to listen, you can subscribe on any major podcast platform. Just search for Innovation with Mark Peter Davis.